Well, good morning, everybody, including the honorable judges of the Madras High Court, honorable judges of uh, um, Opposal Judiciary, senior advocates and uh, advocates and my beloved youngsters to whom the webinar is dedicated to. And uh, we have a panel discussion today in the Lex webinar series number 40. And the panel discussion about uh, the topic co what is ADR and ODR alternative dispute resolution and online dispute resolution. The panel consists of Honorable Justice K. Kannan, uh, Mr. N.L. Raja, Senior Advocate, and Mr. A.J. Jawad. And um, the deliberation will commence with uh, Justice K. Kannan to begin with. And he will be deliberating on uh, the subject court annexed mediation challenges, ODR, and artificial intelligence. And followed by Mr. N.L. Raja, Senior Advocate, on the topic of need for change of mindset to embrace um, effective ADR mechanism and uh, to be concluded by Mr. Jawad on mediation and conciliation as a viable alternative for the existing justice delivery system. Justice Kannan was um, uh, a just judge of Madras High Court, elevated in the year 2008. Later, he was uh, transferred to Punjab and Haryana High Court in Chandigarh. And um, he has authored a lot of books of erudition on very large subjects. And he's one of the finest uh, mediator and a very famous blogger. His principle, the public declaration of assets as the first judge, judge ever in India is a footstep to be followed by many. And uh, India Today Weekly has named Justice Kannan as the among the 20 heroes of the year 2009. And he retired from the judgeship in the year 2016. Thereafter, Justice Kannan presided over the Railway Claims Tribunal as the chairman at its principal bench at Delhi. After retirement, um, Justice Kannan has been serving the society as a mediator with dedication and commitment. And his center for ADR called Mathiastam has used its name in the annals of effective ADR mechanism. So I may request um, Justice Kannan to um, start the deliberation. Sir, you are welcome. The forum is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Sinvasaragman. Uh, you literally send uh, some jitters to me, you know, announcing the 40th lecture. And there are uh, persons attending to this with all uh, earnestness. I hope I don't fail you. On certainly, certainly not, sir. <laughs> yeah. So, um, see, uh, I'll get to straight to what we are uh, to be talking. It all started of us, uh, in 1906 when, um, in a talk arranged by American Bar Association, Pound, who was a professor, 36 years old. Uh, he was uh, talking about uh, the causes of popular dis uh, dissatisfaction in the administration of justice. Almost like uh, Bharati are saying, Why? when we always uh, think it's uh, the previous generation, 100 years back, things were be better. No, it's not like that. Uh, 100 years back, Pound was uh, saying there is a popular dissatisfaction in the administration of justice. So they were all thinking about how do we carry things better. Vigmore, who was there, the famous Vigmore of uh, Vigmore evidence, he was there to identify in a talk of what uh, Pound did. Uh, this is a white flame. This man has something to say that he says it just can't be there in courts. There is so much else to be done. And there needs to be judicial settlement. There needs to be effort to bring parties together to secure conflicts to be resolved in different ways. Why is it just only courts? This kind of archaic practices, uh, these procedural laws really fetter the administration of justice was what uh, Pound was saying. It took nearly about 70 years when uh, the Chief Justice Berger at the time, he had uh, another talk in the same place where the discussion was originally held in 1906. That became the Pound Conference, when they said, now, what have we done? Have we improved over these 70 years? That is the question which he raised. And Sanders was there, one of uh, uh, the foremost thinkers and the professors of Harvard was there at that time in that meeting. And uh, Sanders said, uh, we need uh, multi-door courthouses. At the courts, you open the door, you have the judge in court, just not that. From the court will open several other doors. There will be arbitration, there will be non-binding arbitration, there will be mediation, there will be conciliation elsewhere. So therefore, the doors of the court shall not merely open to a judge sitting in the court and lawyers 
thumping the fists on the tables, but they will also be associated with other things which are intimately connected to the cause of resolution of disputes. This is how it was uh, conceived in 1976. And when they were, Sanders brought this multi court uh, uh, houses, so multi -door, uh, door court houses. Uh, he was uh, truly opening up a whole new area for the courts to be identifying themselves with. And, uh, and thankfully for us, it was uh, the law commission, which uh, even before the 2000, 1999 and 2002 amendment, in 1989, they came with a recommendation that we need other alternate disputes uh, uh, resolution mechanisms. So therefore, we had the Legal Service Authority contemplated local dialects. That was the first uh, mm -hmm. of an alternative dispute. ADR uh, came through the local dialects for us. And uh, that was uh, the Legal Service Authority had in 1985 to start with. Probably later, we had uh, in the Arbitration Conciliation Act, conciliation making a reference, arbitration making reference. These were all identified as alternatives to the court systems. And then we had to wait till 1999 and 2002, but then the Salem Bar Association, the, there's a famous case where of, uh, all of us are acquainted with, uh, they had a reason to be seriously aggrieved. They were not very happy. The Salem Bar truly represented a national uh, concern that there are so, so many things which are being introduced which can hamper our court practice. That was how it was seen. But then we had uh, very scholarly judgments uh, through Justice, uh, speaking through Justice Ravindran, then the previous Chief Justice in the first Salem Bar one. Uh, we had the important uh, issues uh, laid down. And then the court said that, uh, that uh, in uh, uh, Afghanistan, it had to wait till literally 2010 when better articulation was made by the Chief, uh, by the Supreme Court in Afghan's constructions. And it said three things, that there shall be an appropriate stage for referring a case, if it is there for mediation, then we're talking about as mediation, as another important area of activity, as an ADR. And the court must explain the different ADR formulations which are available before it assigns the parties to any particular thing. And uh, that was the second thing. And a mediation facility or service is not available, that the parties can offer the guidance of the court itself. And uh, he should be actively involved in settlements. Uh, tell me honestly, uh, do you think any judge says, uh, explains to you the several options which are available and say, no, move over to this, it just does not happen. Uh, probably in some matters, uh, what we are all familiar with, if it is a matrimonial matters, probably under 482, mm -hmm. then proceeding or something like that, you have immediately attempts made or in, um, in almost all the uh, family courts you have, uh, mediation centers attached, that they go there, they get assigned. Uh, initially, it was uh, the problem was uh, that you take time, you want time, and therefore you seek for a reference to mediation. Therefore, you get some more time. This is how it was seen. Now, there is a greater uh, awareness that mediation works, and it has worked extraordinarily well in some places. Uh, Chennai to start with, and uh, probably we were responsible in uh, taking to all places. And uh, I'm truly concerned of what you have seen already. Um, oh, why is it? I'm not seeing it. It has gone off for me. Are you hearing? Yes, I'm able to. I'm able to hear you, sir. You're able to hear me. All right. Sorry, yeah. not for me. So uh, there was a, a, a the ADR, the mediation um, when it was uh, taken up. Um, look at the numbers. The, because I'm going to telling. I'm going to be telling you only about two things. Uh, only about uh, the court and its mediations because of the ADR and the ODR of suddenly uh, there is a lot of interest. If you connect to the court these days, it is only through the online dispute resolution mechanism. It's, uh, is it that uh, when we are talking about virtual courts, uh, are we talking about, uh, is that an online dispute resolution? Then therefore there is some misunderstanding. I thought I should uh, just take up these two before I leave it to the other two panelists. Um, of the court, I was looking at the statistics morning. It's available for you to see. Uh, there's the total number of cases of what are there in India. It's about 3.25 crores. Uh, we are talking about a number of which you have uh, uh, 90,66,861 civil cases. 
and 2 crore 34 lakhs, 52,822 criminal cases. Uh, look at the number. Uh, you have uh, civil cases probably about 35 to 37 percent, and the rest of it are all criminal cases. Tamil Nadu presents, however, a different picture. Rather surprising to me when I was looking at it in the morning, just before I began this talk. And the total cases which are pending in uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, 11 lakh 69,026, of which civil cases are 6 lakh 58,519. And criminal cases, 5,10,507. Criminal cases, less than the civil cases. It's very different from the national scene. We have less number of criminal cases than the civil cases. Because whenever we are talking about mediation, we are talking essentially from the civil cases perspective. They may be responsible for so many of the criminal cases. So therefore, when we are talking about some of the civil cases, they also have an immediate way it operates elsewhere. Look at this again. I've told you about the numbers, not to bore you with too many things. Just to let you know, we are talking about 6 lakh cases of civil cases and somewhere close to about 5 lakh and all civil cases uh, and criminal cases. And I was looking at the numbers uh, for, two, for uh, January to December 2019, the civil cases which are brought to settlement through ADR process. When I'm taking really arbitration, how many cases are there in arbitration in various places? We don't have that kind of statistics available through our uh, state legal service authority. It tells you in civil cases, 12,000 cases. Now, for a whole year, we have done 12,000 cases, and the matrimonial out of them is 2,565. And in the criminal cases, you have about 3,000 cases, and the MCOP, 264 cases. Now, are talking about lakhs of cases, and uh, you make a reference about a few thousands of cases as what is going through the ADR process. Something seriously wrong. If you must only be thinking that we are going to approach the issue of areas of cases, or even forget about numbers and areas, uh, just think about the total conflicts which exist in the society and how people are looking to courts for answers. And if it's not court, we are looking through our ADR mechanisms. If we are going to be talking as against the five lakhs and six lakhs to disposals in a whole year to 12,000, it's a gross mismatch. There is something seriously wrong. We, unless we address it, we won't be able to do good. First, I think uh, the problem is too much of reliance of cases to be mediated only if it is referred through courts. Other wish that we think about mediation as something which is worthwhile, which can truly endure for parties. Imagine a case which is disposed of by court. All the disposals of what we are talking about, where we beat our chest and then feel very happy about what we have done. There are never cases which are disposed of. Cases get displaced from one forum to another. That's why Pound started when he was, when he was saying in 1906, there is an unusual habit of persons looking for success in a conflict. And therefore, you, you, are, uh, you talk about it when you talk about litigation. You talk or when we want to see how things are sorted out. We are, these lawyers have a sporting uh, theory of justice. What do you mean by sporting theory? It's not being sportive. The sporting theory, as what Pound was saying, was uh, will to win. Uh, in a conflict, do you really win anything? When there are two persons in conflict, where do you win? Uh, how, how do both parties feel happy and satisfied is what, uh, what is essential. Every judge knows as he disposes of the case with the best effort that he has put in, he's dispatching one party happy, one party not so happy. We need, therefore, in our orientations, we need other ways of securing justice to a party. Don't ever think that you're going to lose out on your income by suggesting a party to a mediation. That's completely wrong. And I'm sure uh, what is the change in uh, mindset? Uh, Raja has enough to think and say. Uh, so therefore, I'll not broach that. I just wanted to only say, flag this position that reference to quotes as that will bring large number of uh, disposals just wouldn't happen. Ideas must be supported for their own cause, not really coming through court. But then that is what we worry about. 
uh, we have just not small number. We have such a huge number of 3.2 crores. Why do we go elsewhere? The courts must start the process is very important. Every judge must be convinced that there is something truly worthwhile that a case is settled. And therefore, I'm going to dispatch the case. Justice Ravindran thinks in Salem Bar that a court will explain, the part, explain to the parties the various uh, alternatives available. And it cannot be taking place. At least we need approaches. We need to know that they have a lot to do, that the courts can't really deliver justice wholesale. And 100 years back, when somebody was talking about it, of popular dissatisfaction, we still carry the dissatisfaction now. So uh, to, our numbers are not good enough. Uh, mediation does not really add up to anything in terms of numbers to a total number of cases, one area which I wanted to merely highlight. And therefore, how to move forward, I also say now issues of attitudes of what the Raja will probably say and how the courts also, of judges feeling satisfied because we have so many of, I don't want to name them, I, I know so many of the judges who don't believe mediation has anything to do worthwhile. Or if they assume that the case is referred to arbitration, that the interventions under 34 so easily done because it's easy for the court to be staying proceedings and then keep it there. At least in some courts I know. Uh, all evidence will be open. In Punjab and Haryana, they literally, in every arbitral uh, case in Section 34, you literally be running through all evidence. So approaches where there is not willing to let go is a problem with the judges. So therefore, that also would require to be seen and different. ADR does, cannot succeed if the court breathes down the neck of a mediator or an arbitrator or how he performs. That they all, they, all these institutions must work well. They work with uh, enormous efficiency is what we need to believe. There is ODR on ODR. I just wanted to say um, the, this, uh, what we now experience um, of filing cases, uh, online dispute resolution probably came through PayPal and eBay. Uh, in a very big way for small time business transactions where you buy something, you are not satisfied with the kind of product which you have got, you have an issue, then PayPal sets it up for you. And they are able to now deliver anything within uh, say about 45 days. They give an answer to you, they let you uh, negotiate initially. If it doesn't happen, if it does not turn out correctly for you, it is escalated to the next level. They hand out to you what is appropriate in the situation. From there, we have come a long way. In permanent local dialects, if I have seen uh, the issue of conciliation taking place uh, and the order is final, it's never taken as final. They will they be brought under challenge at 227 and uh, our uh, approaches to 227 is literally whatever was possible in revision, it is called as revision and therefore that extraordinary jurisdiction of what the uh, high court possesses, uh, we almost take it as the courts of appeal in so many of the local dialects or permanent local dialect decisions. Um, they inter intervened at all times. But in the virtual courts of what we are talking about in ODR, uh, we expect e failing in a very big way. Probably Delhi High Court uh, has done rather well with some courts which are paperless courts. Um, right now, I had an experience recently during this lockdown period of overseeing some filing. Uh, it's pathetic the way it is happening. You, you take literally 10 days to have a case uh, registered. Why? Because uh, if documents are zip or sent in a zip file, large uh, large volume of uh, documents are there. They are sent through zip file. You have the other side from the registry. Somebody saying, "Sir, we see only all these things through our cell phones. We can't open. Please send it through uh, in a PDF format each document. Large number of files to be seen, and then they are seeing through the." Uh, uh, cell phone and then probably passing it on to another person and then there's a computer for that person to see. Doesn't happen and uh, uh, among other things, the returns I also saw. Docket not, uh, docket not sent in for a digital format for the document. That's rather surprising. What is the docket which uh, we have the list of documents. So whatever you see in the physical uh, filing is what you are expecting in the digital format as well. So. Uh, that is what I see as a problem is there is a dedicated staff which is necessary. The limitations which exist in ODR practices are large. One, I would say, um, there is a lack of dedicated staff. It has to work. And the, because we are talking about some procedures which are different, even that requires a legislation now. We are 
it's too much of hadokism the way it is practiced now this odr can't succeed if we don't have a special legislation allowing for different things information technology act probably uh, makes us realize that digital evidence is acceptable but then on matters of filing of documents how they shall be uh, how the court fee, even the court fee issue i found it was not a very easy thing i was looking at it it takes a long time before it uh, gets registered it must all be seamless processes but i'm sure one way of looking at it is we are the, everything has its time we will uh, have the time another one is uh, a consistency standardized uh, method it is not yet available probably in one of the judgments recently made by uh, one of our judges here there is a lack of uh, standardization lack of consistency is what he said as a reason why he was passing a particular order just to for us to know that it's important again uh, odr uh, this virtual courts uh, are uh, among other things virtual uh, odr is uh, all not virtual courts it's it is but one uh, facet and therefore seeing there even uh, as we do uh, we need different adopt better methods because what happens in courts is uh, you have the document you suddenly pass it across to the judge he sees it in the, this can't happen we can't show you a document before the phone or hold it before a cell phone and expect the judge to see it so therefore a process of real court hearings are truly hard to replicate that's why in a talk by just chandra chud a couple of days back to some students at the university he was saying virtual courts just can't supplant real courts and for arguments the physical presence so uh, there are issues uh, which are very um, serious it will not be replicated uh, but then there is an opportunity all of us are suddenly introduced to some systems some methods of practice and uh, there is a talk somewhere uh, and i was uh, a little surprised because the bar council must embrace what is happening through the situation in a big way they shouldn't think there is a has and the have nots what do we do there are so many of our poor lawyers who do not have heard just don't worry don't bring this down because it's not even fair the accessibility to computers even if it's not a big computer through cell phone so much is possible tell me if there is one person who doesn't have a cell phone these days so therefore it's possible that you suddenly make uh, the access improved through this is what we must realize and therefore where do we check these access in any way that is a worry that is the worry we must have do we have enough gatekeepers to ensure that only the right kind of things come in or does anyone come in through any system and create a problem so therefore um, we need to know that odr office enormous scope um, it can be applied in every situation but then um, we we will not believe that this is going to be you know, making a major divide between some class of lawyers who can't afford it. affordability is just not an issue i'm sure uh, the supreme court is talking about uh, thinking about uh, introducing uh, various uh, access points uh, from where people from all uh, sections of people even the most vulnerable areas uh, are able to access so now, i'll just leave uh, with this preliminary observations of what i see uh, that we will not resist the application of uh, technology it's a great thing of what has happened covid uh, is uh, probably a unusual unifier in some sense i don't think i would have seen so many of my friends as i am now seeing through this uh, just on a normal day if not for covid probably apart from one or two persons of who i could be seeing in a day i may not have any any other contact now we are suddenly speaking more hearing more a reading more everything is in greater uh, numbers that we don't lose out on a normal day is what we need to be reminding ourselves that we carry this tempo and that we have been set through truly a wonderful tempo just don't put your guards down it's essential to stay afloat essential to interested in embracing technology to conflict resolution so thanks very much srinivas uh, raghavan and to all friends there so i left something for you to think about and to wait to uh, take it forward i'm sure uh, raja will have more to say about the change in the mindset of what is essential in this present situation thank you very much thank you very much sir in fact uh, your session uh, is nothing but an ice breaking one because the topic is not um, um, known to everybody 
and especially odr is something very new it's in the anvil of the judicial um, uh, what is called a, a gateway so i hope your uh, session will uh, open the eyes of very many people so that in the future uh, in addition to section 8 in cpc we have got more avenues in the form of alternative dispute report uh, i think resolution mechanism thank you sir um uh, before going to the next panelist i want to introduce this is i think mr raja is an advocate a senior advocate of madras high court he is one of the um finest advocate practicing in uh, field of rights original site drafting and convincing arbitration consumer protection laws and energy laws and he is also a former president of madras consumer courts bar association and is the form, former trustee and currently the advisor of citizen consumer and the civic connection groups and etc and he is also one of the um what is called the four runner of the movement called adr and uh, may I request mr nl raja to um, commence his deliberation on the need to change the mind of, mindset of advocates such as and especially general public to embrace an effective adr mechanism mr raja sir please good morning friends uh, thanks to mr srinivas rai govan hemalata and welcome to my esteemed panelists mr khannan and mr jawar um i'm glad to for the opportunity given to me to share my thoughts on towards adr odr now that's a very um, wide topic and uh, i thought that i will deal with mindsets in this process of alternate dispute resolution and online dispute resolution what are the mind blocks that we have and what are the mistakes that we are making in uh, making these systems of justice redressal popular now the first thing that i like to um, ask is when we talk about alternate dispute resolution system in india what is alternate about because as i can see a system of justice in a system of delivery of justice which is not dependent upon your conventional modes of justice delivery is what is an alternate dispute resolution system isn't it but think about the dispute resolution systems that we have in india they are either controlled by the executive or in a manner uh, 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 controlled by the judiciary so if you have a system you call it alternate dispute resolution system but that system is once again uh, controlled by the executive and is controlled by the judiciary and there can never not be anything alternate about it isn't it so this is my first agony as far as the working of the adr system is concerned as far as the control by judiciary is concerned judiciary after the 1996 act is enacted it is a very uh, in the sense a very welcome development but the judiciary must also ask itself the question whether it is doing things in favor of putting in place a truly alternate dispute resolution system when it starts court next arbitration court next mediation i mean then what does it alternate to an alternate system of uh, justice delivery must be alternate to the conventional judicial system so if you set up a arbitration center or if you establish a mediation center and call it court next arbitration court next mediation then in my opinion at least it detracts from this concept of alternate dispute resolution system therefore the first mindset that must come is that courts by all means you set up a alternate dispute resolution system for it an arbitration center but ensure that after it is established you completely distance yourself from the process that you have nothing to do with it the administration of that center is uh, done by a group of individuals they may be advocates i'm saying don't restrict it to advocates bring in people public persons bring in uh, infuse fresh blood into the management and distance yourself from working of those institutions the only way in which the judiciary can come in is to provide the infrastructure for these institutions beyond that there is nothing that the judiciary must do if it wants to really set up an effective alternate dispute resolution system that's my opinion likewise in respect of mediation set up a mediation center provide whatever facilities you want get the government to provide the facilities you want do a bit of hand holding if that is required but at a point disconnect yourself from the functioning of that center and say now you are on your own 
so long as the arbitration center is regulated by once again a committee of the high court the mediation center is once again regulated by a committee of the high court then in my humble uh, contention there is not going to be an alternate dispute resolution system at all um, therefore the first mindset must come from the judiciary in recognizing establishing hand holding institutions which will do arbitration and mediation but at a particular point kindly disconnect yourself from these institutions and allow them to be truly independent this is the way it works in every uh, country and i hope that if we need if we are to make adr functional at all we must bring in systems where the judiciary uh, distances itself from all beings of arbitration and mediation currently you establish an arbitration center high courts must uh, know when to distance themselves from the functioning of the alternate dispute resolution centers and that is the first mindset has to come the second mindset is on the part of the executive the executive must decide you know all these traditional arbitration clauses in government contracts there is an officer name he is an employee and then he gets to arbitrate if there is a Uh, you know, dispute, and for a long time, the Supreme Court held that these arbitration clauses are fantastic. I mean, there is nothing wrong about them. It is all right for the managing director to be an arbitrator in a dispute. It is all right that he was part of the uh, execution of the contract at various stages. It is all right that uh, he actually uh, uh, was in charge of directing the manner in which the contract was executed at uh, certain aspects. All this, the uh, Supreme Court said, was all. So in 2015, uh, I was part of the uh, law commission deliberations with Justice A. P. Chasen. This, and uh, we looked into this question of how do we infuse some independence into this process, and then that led to certain changes in 2015, and there were further changes um, in 2018. There is some set of amendments which we did in 2019. Uh, very importantly, Section 12.5. of the arbitration conciliation act says that certain classes of people are disqualified from being arbitrators and they have been specifically enumerated in the 7th schedule of the act now this is remarkable because uh, that is borrowed from the uh, the the uh, list of those who cannot be arbitrators is borrowed from the list created by the international bar association but that is only a guideline right for the first time india is the only country that has made it binding right so uh, because of the peculiar circumstances that exist in this country they said that we need to ensure that uh, we have certain classes of arbitrators persons who will not be qualified to be arbitrators so seven schedule section 12.5 was all introduced in the arbitration state right but even after that there had to be some very dynamic thinking on the part of the supreme court and some of the judgments in recent times point to that the first is the tr of energy engineering where the supreme court applied section 125 and the seventh schedule of the arbitration conciliation act and said that a managing director who on account of the seventh schedule is today disqualified to be an arbitrator cannot then appoint an arbitrator so he carried this uh, concept a little further and said not only are you disqualified from being an arbitrator but once you are disqualified from being an arbitrator you have no power to appoint an arbitrator so that was an uh, really a quantum jump in the manner in which the court looked at uh, alternate dispute resolution systems and said it should be truly alternate uh, and the parties the concerned parties must not be involved in that. that judgment Uh, got a shot to the arm in Perkins Eastman, where it was followed, and uh, just a simple statement where he says she expands that concept. That proposition is expanded, and she says that even if a party has something to do in the outcome of an arbitration proceeding, then that party is disqualified from appointing an arbitrator. So that is the second quantum leap which we took, and we said that a person who is Uh, in some way benefited or it is impacted by the outcome of an arbitration proceeding cannot have a say um, in the uh, appointment of an arbitrator 
that judgment was once again followed in broadband network limited case where once again supreme court upheld the same concept and on account of these principles uh, the supreme court has now uh, made um, the arbitration free of executive control in as much as governments can't have their own resources of course it has now suffered a slight setback with its judgment in the central organization for railway uh, electrification association case before the supreme court where in that case the arbitration clause said that uh, the uh, the central uh, organization for railways will draw up a list of five employees who is suggest can be arbitrators and from that list the contending party can choose two arbitrators now unfortunately this if the judgment in parkman system is applied then since central organization for railway electrification has a say in the outcome of the arbitration or has is impacted by the judgment to be passed award to be passed by the arbitrator it must not have a say in appointment of the arbitrator but it said that since you are not appointing the arbitrator but only giving a list uh, it does not affect uh, strangely in that judgment parkman seesment is referred but is not uh, but is not dissented from so uh, isman parkman uh, seesment is today still good law uh, but uh, there is this departure that has been made hopefully uh, this 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 issue will be resolved in the bayana builders private limited matter which is now pending in the supreme court no judgment has uh, been delivered but this question has been uh, um, argued and uh, it is hoped that the supreme court will say how these two judgments have to be integrated but the point that i am making is that slowly the the executive also understands that if it is offering an alternate dispute resolution system then it must truly be alternate to whatever internal systems of dispute resolution it has or uh, dispute resolution systems in which it has a say so that is the second development uh, that we see today hopefully it should uh, lead to a better arbitration regime the third is our collective apathy including me including everybody who is part of the legal uh, framework in not ensuring that the directions given this is kind of was also interesting it in the afcons judgment uh, uh, by the supreme court in 2010 where significantly it said that activate section 89 frame rules under section 89 make section 89 meaningful this unfortunately has not been followed in the sense that to my understanding what that means is that every litigation filed in court every litigation pending in court must be sent first to mediation they must try to resolve that matter if the resolution does not follow parties must be advised to try and uh, um, you know adopt uh, methods of arbitration so effectively the uh, the court docket must be clear this is kadan was also uh, mentioning the famous observations of lord uh, warren burger the same thing happened in america you had a large number of cases in mid 70s and america was reeling at the backlogs so this is warren burger actually institutionalized this process of decluttering the, um, the, the the docket of the court and would send matters out for mediation and for arbitration today nearly 10 years or 11 years after the judgment we passed we still have not framed the rules under section 89 of the code um, of civil procedure and um, for the manner and process in which it should be activated twice along with some of few uh, senior advocates of the madras high court i have framed the rules and given it to the rules committee but we need to see uh, how the uh, high court is going to take it so unless we institutionalized section 89 and bring in the change of mindset whereby courts will have a counseling session where it tells the parties about the advantages of mediation mediation doesn't work the mediator himself will suggest ways of taking it to the next step of arbitration unless that is done our court system will get cluttered and i am talking about this uh not only in respect of our uh, civil cases but also i would say in respect of our criminal cases because let us look at the statistics that it puts we keep talking once again about 
this three crore cases pending, right? Of which two crore cases are criminal cases, and one crore case uh, cases are civil cases. But of the two crore cases pending, forty lakhs are check bounce cases. What great question of law is involved in the check bounce? Uh, please listen to uh, the uh, to, to the talk uh, I think given by Mr. Datta uh, with regard to pendency of these matters because various uh, criminal courts, and he relies on statistics which shows that <clears throat> in Madras state. There were some 10,400 prosecution under the Companies Act. 9,000 of them are silly issues that, in the balance sheet, instead of reflecting the figures in rupees, you have stated them in dollars. So this is one great issue which is now pending before criminal courts for criminal prosecution. Okay, this amounts to misrepresentation under the Companies Act, and therefore it is now. Why must the dockets of the court be cluttered with matters like this? Compound these offences, settle these offences, find these offences. How is a citizen affected because in the balance sheet the figures are stated in dollars and cents? So this meaningless prosecution is all being closed, and I would say that the government is taking a very proactive steps in making many of the offences under the Companies Act compound. Therefore, we need to declutter under this process. This is the mindset. The mindset towards. Decluttering goes, and that has to come. In. And in that process, we need to ensure it is just not civil cases, but criminal cases. Also, we need to go through this process of trying to compound matters, close prosecutions, and ensure that the number of pendency in cases comes down. And for that, we need to have an overall policy. A policy is a map. Now you can't lose both the way and the map. Now you don't have a map. You don't know where where the way is. How will you ever reach a destination? So the policy is a map. Have a map drawn up for the next. The Madras High Court must have a map, litigation map for the next five years. If I say my current pendency is four lakh cases, at the end of five year period, I must have a pendency of just one lakh cases. This is what is my path that I will take to reach that goal. This policy and anything that detracts from that policy, the court uh, must seriously visit with consequences. Like if a case uh, drags on endlessly, there must be cost. Cost must be levied. It must be realistic cost, not 250 rupees, 500 rupees. The uh, litigant and the lawyer will go uh, laughing out of court if somebody is going to after 13 hearings and a delay of some 2,000 days in filing a written statement. If he is allowed to get off. With just a fine of some rupees, so discourage that type of practice. Therefore, lay down your policy roadmap, lay down the path to get there, and that is the mindset that needs to change. I will briefly, before um, I don't want to intrude into Jawad's time, but before uh, I hand over the uh, mic to Jawad, I would just like to uh, make a brief mention on this online dispute resolution, with special emphasis um, on. Uh, uh, the um, uh, courts, that is the online courts that we are adopting. Please understand, there is a brilliant speech by Justice Madhav Mohan Kapoor, who has been part of implementing this e-court process, and he will tell you there is no shortage of resources at all. There is plenty of money that has been set aside. In fact, the tragedy is that this money is not being utilized under the e-courts project under the 14th. Uh, Finance Commission, 700 crores was allotted for digitizing court records. Just as uh, Lokur laments that not a single court uh, utilized any sizable part of that fund, and that money went back to the central scheme unspent. So where are you talking about the lack of resources? There is there is now currently the e-court grid. There is the e-seva which has been set up by the government. On account of which, plenty of detail is details are now available even to the high court. He once again cites the case of he says sitting in his room, a high court judge can look at the manner in which the the courts, each high court judge, or at least a substantial number of them, are allotted portfolio jurisdiction. He says sitting in his court through the uh, uh, grid that has been national grid uh, that has been created, a judge can look at how. Any of his inferior, um, the subordinate officers are functioning. He says in one case, which was taken as a test case, 113 adjournments had been given 
in a matter of eight months in a trial of a case. And these 118 uh, adjournments, he says there are 95 adjournments. That is, that is the record that is available in court to this judge and asked him, why are you taking all this long? So, you know, these are facilities towards are available to you. Service, process. Justice Loco says that they took a particular court uh, as a court to examine and they found that 70% of the process are served only one week before the case comes for hearing. And he said there is a uh, he process serving facility that is offered by the central government called NSTEP. And with NSTEP, the, the, the papers are sent directly to the process saver. The process saver has a GPR tracking to his uh, phone. So the court can once again verify, the registrar can verify whether he actually went to that place. All this can be verified just sitting in their offices. Why is this not being done? This again calls for a mindset about how effectively we can handle these. Since lawyers must not look on this as some sort of an obstacle. They must understand that with e-courts, we can have more disposals. If you have more disposals, you have more kind of satisfied clients. If you have more satisfied clients that lead to larger workloads, if it leads to larger workloads, an advocate is going to uh, be kept more busy. And obviously, when an uh, advocate is going to be kept more busy, he's going to earn more. So obviously, this is all to their benefit. And we must look on it from, from that aspect. And there is, this is not any great rocket science. And we have also at NBAC suggested, what is the uh, roadblock to this? The roadblock to this is, many advocates are not very comfortable with filing cases. E-filing cases pose the phone problems. So what we had suggested is, such as we are working with the Skill Development Council of India to develop para-illegals who can set up kiosks all over the state to whom we can approach and do this job of filing. And they will also do, for a small fee, a hand-holding right through the process of the uh, progress of this. Train these people in, in, uh, in coordination with the state judicial academies. Train these people. Give them a license to practice. Encourage them to set up kiosks. Make them paralegals who will help you the process of uh, taking the e-court project further. The lawyers reluctant to use this system will vastly reduce the so these are the mindsets that we need to change for this entire process to become more effective. And uh, I will be um, quite happy to join later discussions. As I said, I don't want to uh, uh, intrude into Jawad's time. I'm sure he has some more useful things to say than what I was. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Actually, in fact, your session is here rather than in the name in the form of a brainstorming session. I hope the persons who are in the helm of affairs will understand the need to change the mindset uh, and to see that uh, the road for uh, the ADR mechanism is made more meaningful and people friendly. And before um, inviting uh, Mr. Jawad, I just want to say a few words because Jawad is for the first time joining our webinar. So I find it is necessary to introduce him to our uh, participants. Mr. Jawad has been a legal practitioner and has extensive experience in mediation and conciliation since 2007. Mr. Jawad has been a trained and acclaimed mediator. His expertise in mediation includes all areas of conciliatory fields uh, and more particularly commercial, contractual, matrimonial, and child custody disputes under the court annexed mediation programs of the Madras High Court. Mr. Jawad has been an accredited trainer under the National Mediation and Conciliation Plan of the Supreme Court of India, and he has trained empty number of lawyers and judges in mediation skills all over the country. Mr. Jawad is one of the senior most trainers in India and has conducted several training of trainers, TOT workshops for the Supreme Court of India. He was the joint secretary of the Tamil Nadu Mediation Conciliation Center of the High Court of Madras. Jawad has uh, recently undergone a specialist mediation workshop conducted by SNC at Bangalore. And Mr. Jawad is one of the founder trustees of Foundation for Comprehensive Dispute Resolution, FCD at Chennai which offers mediation trainings and services. With this, I cordially invite Mr. Jawad to start his deliberation. Mr. Jawad, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Srinivas Raghavan, for that uh, very nice introduction that you gave. Um, Raja has come out with some very hard facts. And uh, 
has pointed out uh, why it is important to change the mindset just so skandan also traced the history of how uh, alternate dispute resolution uh, started in the us uh, the very idea was mooted sometime way back in uh, 1906 but it took root only in the 1970s i think it was in 76 77 when the pound conference was held and uh, frank sanders uh, presented his paper on the idea of multi door courthouse concept now i just want to carrying on from where uh, justice kannan and uh, raja had uh, spoken starting from there i just want to go a little bit into uh, why this mindset is not changing for us because even today uh, our mediation center was started in 2005 i would say that lot of development has taken place and lot of advocates have realized the efficacy of it and have embraced it but still there is an element of uh, resistance somewhere Uh, so why is this resistance coming and wh- what is it uh, got to do with our understanding of uh, what is justice uh, i think the resistance comes even for example the salem uh, uh, advocates bar association case itself uh, was based on that uh, resistance to the change that was sought to be brought about through section 89 by introducing adr processes i think it is somewhere rooted in our understanding of uh, the idea of justice i think we believe in the institutionalized justice uh, what is called um, as a social contract theory or the positive law theory as propounded by john austin and others i think what we have done is we have inherited a system uh, uh, from the british Uh, the system where uh, you know we have uh, institutions which lay down the law which have in, we have institutions that implement the law and we have institutions that uphold the law so it is institutionalized justice that we have come to believe in and our belief is so strong that we are not willing to look at alternatives now is that system bad is the institution uh, in, institutionalized justice system bad no i won't say that i would say that it has served its purpose uh, it has done quite a lot in upholding justice uh, it has also done a lot in uh, you know uh, showing us the way forward in advancing as a society uh, ensuring the rights of people uh, ensuring the rights of the marginalized all these things have happened through these institutions undoubtedly we cannot say that you know these institutions have become redundant or irrelevant and uh, i wouldn't dare to say that at all because uh, these institutions are absolutely necessary but if you look at it from the you know perspective of uh, access to justice my question a uh, question that i would like to ask myself is uh, what exactly is ne- needed today to ensure what is called as realized justice now there is a difference between institutionalized justice now what happens in institutionalized justice we have framed laws we have substantive laws we have procedural laws now the substantive laws define our rights and obligations the procedural laws prescribe how we should if supposing those rights are violated how do we enforce those rights through the institutions such as the judiciary now we are so uh engrossed in that part of uh, you know uh, we we are so uh, em- our uh, thought process is so embedded in that understanding of justice that we can't look at anything else now is this a flawless system is it without absolute flaws is it uh, uh, we have in our courts you know fiat us ttr what kelam many of the courts have that but do we realize that uh, do we really uh, realize that kind of justice through the system the fault is not with the system the fault is with the way we understand justice we have formulated certain laws now whatever comes within those laws is only right everything else that falls outside that however right it might be however morally right it might be uh, it it still cannot be Uh, agitated in a court of law and you cannot enforce a moral right so what do we do now no if you uh, i was uh, i i have just started reading uh, amartya sen's idea of justice and uh, he refers to two concepts you know sanskrit uh, words he uses 
uh, he says niti and nyaya niti is institutionalized justice and nyaya is realized justice justice in action now many times what we have seen institutionalized justice may not be able to render complete justice now in many of the training programs whenever judges have come for have been trained i have asked this question how many situations have you come across where you have felt that party a is right party b is wrong but you still cannot decide in favor of party a for the simple reason that the law says otherwise because the law stops you from deciding in favor of party a though instinctively deep down inside you you feel that party a is right often most of the time the answer is yes we have come across many such cases where we feel that one party is right but unfortunately the law is against him therefore we cannot decide in his favor now this is where you know there this slight uh, the, this uh, what should i say uh, uh, sort of a dissonance arises uh, as to you know the the efficacy of institutionalized justice does it really render justice in all spheres in all aspects in in the manner in which it should be able to do complete justice undoubtedly we have say article 142 of the supreme court but that is vested only in the supreme court not in any other courts not even the high courts have the power of article 142 to render complete justice now there was a case uh, recent uh, supreme court for example in a matrimonial matter Uh, though the idea of irretrievable breakdown of marriage is not statutorily recognized but exercising its powers under 142 uh, the supreme court granted the relief of uh, divorce to the parties because they felt that it is uh, there is a it's a situation where the marriage has irretrievably broken down now when we come to these kinds of dissonance where you know we are uh, we realize that yes this person is entitled to Uh, a particular relief but we are unable to grant that relief to this person for the simple reason because the law is against him i am sure many of the lawyers will understand this and uh, many of the judges will also definitely agree with me on this aspect now my question is what do we do to change our mindset because we have it, it is a sort of an endowment effect uh, we have acquired a system we are stakeholders in the system we believe that the system should continue we don't want to look at any alternatives we don't want to look at any other options to make sure that justice is really done where the law is unable to come to the rescue of the people why not we you know explore some options why not why not we explore some some other methods by which we can ensure that people get what they really need instead of just getting what they can get under the law do we need to go beyond that point and see that you know parties get the the litigants who come before the courts or the the parties who are in conflict they get the quietus to the dispute just as kandan rightly pointed out it is not a disposal of a case it is just displacement of the case now what happens one court disposes of the matter the parties go and appeal to the other higher court and the dispute continues there is no quietus to it why is that so it is simple the simple reason is because we are entrusting the responsibility of deciding our problem to a third person whether a judge or an arbitrator i am not saying we shouldn't do that we can we have to do that many times we have to do that but unless we think of some alternatives now today what is the problem that we are facing because of our refusal to look at alternatives or because of this mindset that we have where we are thinking that you know this is the only way of rendering justice and there cannot be any other way of rendering justice we are actually you know uh, clogging the system and the system is today crumbling it, it is crumbling under its own burden so what do we do to overcome this that is where i think we need to examine and that is what we are doing today in examining those alternative methods now what are these alternative methods we have of course arbitration but arbitration again as raja pointed out it ultimately you know every award gets challenged it comes back to the court and again we are back into the uh, the log jam happens again and we come back into the same system that 
we are trying to unclog now the other alternative would be that uh if i may call it the social choice theory but i feel that mediation is based upon you know mediation being a non adjudicatory process where the parties are entrusted with the responsibility of trying to find a solution for their problems where the mediator or conciliator only does the job of facilitating them to come to that conclusion and most important there is a scope for people in conflict to deal with their emotions through these processes which is not available to them in when they go for the institutionalized justice uh, like litigation and arbitration so there what happens is they they don't get the chance to express their emotions because you have to apply the formula the law has prescribed the rights the law has prescribed the obligations the law has prescribed the procedure you follow that and it is like mathematics you know a plus b is equal to so and so whatever that equation might be you reach that equation now there again the justice is as good as your judge or the arbitrator is again i want to just clarify that i am not against the judicial system or any other the conventional system of dispute resolution all i am saying is we need to complement this system to unclog it by vesting the responsibility to the parties themselves helping them to understand what their real interests are and coming to a conclusion that would be beneficial for both of them instead of as just as kannan said you know the sporting method in sports we have to win it is a competition we need to reach the goal post first there is always a winner and a loser i am not saying in mediation everybody is going to be a winner all i am saying is everybody will have to you know once they go through this process of mediation and conciliation then and they come to a conclusion that this is how we wish to resolve our dispute they own that responsibility of resolving their problem therefore they are bound by it and it ensures that they get what is called as emotional satisfaction in mediation we talk about the satisfaction triangle we talk about uh, procedural satisfaction we talk about substantive satisfaction and we talk about emotional satisfaction substantive satisfaction in litigation may not be complete because one party may get the relief that it want it is seeking the other party may not get the relief the other party may be forced to pay for something which the party feels that he he or she is not liable to pay it doesn't end there then it goes to the next forum there again either it might be a concurring judgment or it might be a deferring a dissenting judgment there again what happens if the order is reversed then it leads to a fresh bout of litigation it continues endlessly procedural satisfaction yes because the procedures we have the laws we have the civil procedure code we have the criminal procedure code we have the pro to ensure that you know uh, the 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 procedure is standard it's consistent for everybody we ensure that the procedure is always consistent for everybody and nobody can find fault with the procedure but then many times what happens good claims genuine claims get dismissed on the technicality of procedure because of some procedural discrepancy also you may lose a case though you have a substantive right to claim that so but what happens is in in this process there is no emotional satisfaction because the moment you enter the lawyer's office and hand over the brief to your lawyer you lose control of the case in mediation also it is not that you know lawyers are going to lose out lawyers will be there to help the parties to see how they can resolve their disputes in a manner that will be best for their long term interests see let us not think that you know mediation is a threat for lawyers i'll come to that shortly but let me first deal with the emotional part of it this is probably the only process where parties play a very important role they play a central role what they feel about the dispute not only what they want or what they need it's also how they feel about it which is given consideration to their emotions are dealt with their problems are dealt with how they feel about it that is given importance to and gradually the parties are taken to a stage where they are able to see each other's perspective and are able to collaborate together we, we always say you know separating the person from the problem what happens is we uh, normally parties identify each other as the problem 
but in mediation if you if, just to give you an example like let us say that in in a litigation there are parties who are standing at on two uh, you know two different rock faces and there is a deep chasm between them there's no way you can bridge the chasm but in mediation what happens is an expert mediator is able to take the parties to a stage where they realize that they are st standing on the same rock face the problem that needs to be overcome is crossing that chasm together so, so they start working together they start collaborating together to find a solution to the problem so what happens now is they become collaborators they are not adversaries anymore and it has a huge scope for lawyers it is not as if lawyers are going to lose their bread see i remember when i was uh, doing in one of the districts i was doing an awareness program uh, mr t sivanandan and i had gone there i think bharat chakravarti was also with me uh, we were doing an awareness program on for mediators and in the bar association uh, of the district it was chock a block with lawyers almost more than 300 to 350 lawyers were there and one of the lawyers stood up and very strongly said that you know this is only to rob us of our livelihood this mediation process is only uh, you are bringing it only to rob us of our livelihood and to deprive us of our earnings it is not going to work out a young very young lady junior stood up and she said i disagree with you she said i am a woman and i have seen you know in my own family i have seen cases where uh we take our family member who's uh in the family way we take them to the hospital we expect a normal delivery to take place but just to hike up the fees the hospital tells that you know we have to do a so similarly uh, so th that is what uh, this lady lawyer said and there was pin drop silence after that the lawyers most of the senior lawyers kept quiet listening to it. so when, when we talk mindsets and we when we talk of alternate or appropriate dispute as mr sriram panchu would call it he say calls it as appropriate dispute resolution so my feeling is i think these uh, methods of dispute resolution whether they are appro the appropriate dispute when you look at it as an appropriate dispute resolution method we realize that these are not mutually exclusive whether it is uh, the court system and mediation or arbitration or conciliation are not mutually exclusive but there should always be uh, you know the the option of resorting to first should we first explore the possibility of resolving matters between ourselves through this non adjudicatory process where we fail we come to the court now this is what happened in the other countries like in the us in the 1970s when this concept came about uh, when warren burger thought of this uh, idea and uh, started implementing it the cases in the us used to take 11 years to dispose of from the date of filing to the date of final disposal today it has substantially reduced in italy for instance they have introduced a, an opt out method of uh, mo uh, uh, it's called an opt out model where it is mandatory for every litigant to go for mediation first at least for one session in that one session if they are satisfied they can continue but if they don't they are not able to continue if they feel that mediation is not suitable for them after that one session only then they can come back to the court and they they can file the case so in uk for instance there is a uh, the certain reforms were brought about where it's mandatory for every lawyer to file a statement before the court informing the court that he or she has given a, 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 you know a, a sort of a costing of what will be the cost uh, in terms of time and money in litigation and what will be the cost in terms of uh, time and money in mediation and the client decides to go for mediation uh, then they should give that option to the client and if the client opts for litigation then they can go for litigation so if the statement if this statement is not filed by the lawyer the lawyers are uh, subject to costs so now what happens is it becomes mandatory for the lawyers to explain to the parties that there is an option there for you to resolve this dispute amicably by going through the process of by through the process of mediation or conciliation and if it doesn't work you always have the option of going back to the court now as uh, raja was pointing out i think we need to bring a lot of systemic change in order to make these systems you know uh, work in a manner which is complementary to each other to make sure that parties really uh, the litigants the general public 
really get the kind of justice that they deserve. So it is very important for us to look into all these aspects. And my feeling is that, you know, it, uh, uh, again, I'm just coming back to the concern that many lawyers will be feeling, what happens to our livelihood? Believe me, your livelihood is... Sorry, my connection was unstable again. Uh, your livelihood is not going to be jeopardized. Uh, I was just, uh, I, I had attended, uh, I was doing one uh, training program for judges in the National Judicial Academy. And uh, Mr. Madan Gopal, the director, uh, gave some statistics there. He said that 0.4% of the disputes come to the courts. 99.6% of the disputes don't come to courts. Now, what we are doing, whether it is Srinivas or Agavan or Raja or Javad or uh, anybody else, we are, we are earning our livelihood through that 0.4%. Now, does it mean that only the disputes that come to court are the disputes that are there? There are no other conflicts. There are umpteen number of conflicts. But what is happening? People have lost faith in a system which is, you know, so overburdened. There is no point in blaming anybody. We cannot blame anyone here. But the problem is we have not thought of, you know, easing the burden on the system as a result of which people are losing faith. So if we offer them, uh, you know, they go to, you know, the, what uh, in our Tamil Nadu, we are very famous, we have these cut panchayats or kangaroo courts. They either go to politicians to resolve the disputes, or if you have the money, you uh, either you go to the police station and you try to resolve the dispute, or you just fight with each other, or you just live with the problem. You don't try to find a solution to the problem. Now, is that the right way of doing things? Or should we, you know, provide them with an alternative where legitimately, they can discuss, they can negotiate with each other, where they can, this, this discussion and this negotiation can be facilitated by very skillful and trained mediators and conciliators who can give, help them to you know, reach a, a conclusion that would be acceptable to both of them. Uh, deal with the problem as a problem that is confronting both of them, analyze it and reach to a logical conclusion that would be beneficial for both of them. Or should we continue with this same over, overburdened system and deprive a vast number of people of access to justice. So my feeling is, I think we, it is time for us to seriously, especially our lawyers community, it is very, it's high time for us to sit back and seriously think, including the judges, to think, are we doing the right thing by not <clears throat> offering these alternatives to the parties, to our litigants? Are we doing a disservice to our nation through this? Because remember one thing, uh, I also told this earlier in one of the other webinars, where I was talking to uh, uh, a CEO of an American company who had come here to sign a contract with my client. And he was saying, we prefer to deal with China rather than India. Because in China, the dispute resolution is very fast. Whereas in India, it takes years and years together. Now, when we talk of ease of doing business, one of the most essential components of ease of doing business is ease of dispute resolution. If you are talking about FDI, if you're talking about inviting foreign companies to come and invest in India, if you're talking about even our own industries and companies surviving and continuing with the, uh, <clears throat> uh, their business in a, in, a, in a manner without losing too much of time in litigating disputes in the courts, it is, I think, our duty to offer them some viable alternatives so that they can explore those alternatives if they are not able to resolve the disputes through those alternatives, uh, then they can come to the court. So the court should be the court of last resort. It should not be the court of first resort. It should be the court of last resort, where only those disputes that cannot be mediated or that cannot be resolved through mediation should come for any adjudicatory process, whether it is arbitration or litigation. Now we have uh, uh, Raja, I think, will further talk about uh, uh, Ab med and med are hybrid processes where you know there's a combination of uh, mediation and arbitration and arbitration mediation where matters which are in arbitration are referred to mediation and that part of it that can get resolved through mediation is resolved and the remaining comes back to arbitration so we have ab med ab med ab ab med so there are many various hybrid combinations i think it is time we start thinking innovatively i think it is time we start uh, keeping up with the rest of the world because we are still lagging behind, in spite of the fact that our mediation center started way back in 2005, almost uh, 
so many years have passed 12 13 years have passed but we are not making any headway still uh, private mediation is still of uh, you know it's a distant dream still remains a distant dream the commercial courts act has done very little precious little to uh, really help uh, you know in uh, implementing because we still don't have except i think uh, delhi high court has uh, implemented uh, some sops standard operating procedures for uh, uh, doing a pre litigation mediation whereas none of the other high courts have you know even started that so there are so many things that need to be done and i think it's high time we do that and as far as odr and artificial intelligence is concerned i was recently reading an article uh, about the situation in the us where huge firms actually their billing goes in hours okay they bill on the basis of the number of hours they spent now supposing a client comes to you and wants you to do a due diligence you assign the job to one of the junior partners in the firm and that partner will be taking maybe about you know two hours or to complete the due diligence by going through various processes and you know checking various documents and doing some research and all that now algorithms are being developed you know artificial intelligence is coming into the play those algorithms can do that same work in less than 2 hours or even maybe 20 minutes or even 5 minutes they can do this uh, for example a due diligence now this is where we are heading now this is the next step now now we are still lagging behind in embracing adr so where is the question of us going to odr now so unless we develop adr and we accept adr how are we going to go to the next step odr india is definitely going to be left behind if we as lawyers we don't embrace these changes that are happening globally all over the world and uh, i think uh, the covid 19 pandemic has taught us a very big lesson today we are sitting and talking to so many people i think the participants are almost 70 participants are there or maybe more but we are all able to talk to each other sitting in the comforts of our home that is technology for you and that is the technology that we need to embrace as justice kannan said yes there are challenges question of affordability comes at one point of time way i think about in uh, back or 12 years back you could not uh, not everybody could dream of having a, a cell phone with them today everybody has a cell phone with them not just a cell phone smartphones and people have got used to using the smartphones so it the answer is not to throw the baby with the bath water but to address the issue of accessibility to these uh, this technology to the poorest of the poor i think it is the duty of the government of the judiciary to ensure that people have access to this technology a very good idea was given by raja when he spoke about you know kiosks where e filing can be facilitated we need to brainstorm on these things and we need to come up with ideas where we can embrace technology the whole thing we should remember it is premised on the concept of providing access to justice to the people of this country so unless we do that we are failing in our duty and we are doing a big disservice to our nation is how i look at it thank you so much thank you mr jawad actually um what as you said uh, the um initiative is gaining momentum i would rather say that regarding the e filing and other things um, as mr raja has rightly put it out uh, in the form of kiosk at madurai bench a lot of advocate less have started using a particular chamber as a kiosk and they started um, registering um, um, their email and phone for uh, creating an uh, e filing id and uh, things are going on as it's as you said it is a matter of time i think the youngsters can take the lead uh, because it is very really difficult to convince the um, elders who are uh, 60 plus or unless they have the scientific temperament and i think it is easy for us to motivate the youngsters with all the facilities available and i think you have shown the right path ah. sorry sorry to interrupt you don't don't discount us we are all nearing <laughs> uh, uh, just as kannan is about 60 but i don't know about rajya but i am nearing 60 and i'm sure you are also nearing 60 no no we are all 60 years <laughs> younger yeah, nobody exactly. is 60 years old here we are all 60 years <laughs> younger so that makes all the yeah. difference so thanks for the and uh, very interesting session uh, may i now request uh, just is anand venkatesh um to offer his um, comments yeah, good morning to all the panelists good morning to all so happy to hear all these things but i have small small questions to all the three uh, first i will uh, address it to jawad 
Um, first, Jawad, I'll have to really congratulate uh, the tremendous work that is being done by the Mediation Center. And uh, uh, I am able to see that the confidence level uh, I, I, among the advocates as well as the uh, litigants to approach the Mediation Center is growing, but very slowly growing. But that itself, I am seeing it as uh, a positive. Uh, there are one, two things which I wanted to just discuss. One is the mindset uh, where uh, people are trying to sort of take the mediation center itself or the process of mediation itself as one of the methods to protract the proceedings. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is a mindset which I am able to apparently see in many cases which sometimes makes us fix time limits, which we know is, uh, is very illogical, like six weeks and four weeks and all that. That is done because we ourselves are not very confident about whether uh, they are genuinely asking for a mediation or they are asking it only to protect the proceedings. So if mediation center is going to become one of the roots of uh, trying the old tricks of protracting proceedings, then there is a sort of hesitation to or uh, it, 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 it's a stumbling block for the court to start referring cases to mediation. So this is one mindset which I find, at least with my very, very limited uh, uh, experience uh, as a judge here. So I want to first put that question to you. The second question is to Mr. Yenala Raja. Um, uh, it's the arbitration true there are lots of things that are being attempted to make it a foolproof there are lot of attempts uh, that are being made to uh, uh, to make the, uh, the the appointment of arbitrators uh, to, to be made as more effective but what i find is again this mindset of uh, arbitrations also being made as a tool to protract proceedings in the sense that uh, the amount which we hear for arbitrators and for the advocates who do arbitration, looks like uh, many want to go, go back to the courts uh, rather than suffering with the arbitrators. And, and many there is, a, there is a thought process where people think that if the commercial courts uh, act, uh, disputes are properly streamlined, probably it will be an alternative for arbitration cases. Is the, is the thought process that is going on now among some litigants uh, with whom I have spoken. On that. So, your thoughts on that, Mr. NLR. And the third question is to Justice Kannan. Um, uh, Justice Kannan, I, I had an opportunity to sit for 10 days with this, uh, with uh, a, a laptop or an iPad before me and uh, try my best to sort of do cases. Uh, so what I found was that there are lots of difficulties in interacting and all that because of echo coming up uh, or because somebody is not able to get in there. And we see that in many places, they don't even have the facility of Wi-Fi. They try to get this connection through their mobile app. And by the time uh, all this happens, uh, the, um, the, the prepaid thing gets over. So things like that. Uh, do you think that uh, it requires a change in the very brain mapping for us to really get into this virtual hearing? Because even though I am discussing with all the three, I am putting questions to all the three, somehow I am not able to relate myself to you. Looking at your body language, <laughs> looking at your eyes, looking at you, all that has become a part of my brain. So therefore, does it require a huge uh, change in the very brain mapping itself? for this virtual hearing to get into the system. That's all. Sir, whom do you want to answer first sir, among the three? So that uh, I can ask. So there's a Kannan, sir, I think you can um, give okay, the answer. Okay, the, 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 last, the last question first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Anand, Justice and, Anand. And Justice, Kann, and Justice Kannan, you look so cute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a kid as soon as, soon as he's born, not much affair. <laughs> Rejuvenated. Yeah, it's like that. Not getting an old person losing his hair, a child <laughs> trying to grow hair. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much. Yeah, you're talking about uh, your mind mapping and uh, 
how do you see suddenly things in a different way? It is uh, almost like uh, how you need to get used to certain things. I used to be, I even remember, I used to get up and walk when I had, when I had the cell phone, when I had to carry conversations. It was not a very comfortable thing. And after some time, then you know how easy it is. The same way it's about uh, your uh, virtual course as well. And the one problem is probably the, at, the pers at the end where a person is addressing, he needs to be properly motivated, minded, mindful of and how he has to look. Uh, mm. Physical appearances do matter. The way we present do matter. Uh, but I'm sure it's a very small uh, thing. It, this will get adjusted too soon, far too soon. So I do not think it is a major challenge for any one of us. It's uh, getting used to it. Are we all not getting used from where uh, Mr. Sinovas Raghun started and Hemilatha started about 45 days back to now? I'm sure the kind of comfort they have is uh, Srinivas Raghun is able to easily toggle from one to another, unmute, he says, and now, now you are all right, now you can come online. So that he's able to do. The same thing will happen in the courts. Uh, I've seen it uh, somewhere in Punjab, uh, and somebody brought the laptop, uh, opened his laptop, and then you were saying something, the judge took action and said, and I'll proceed against you for what you're doing. So it, it was there in the court, in a particular court. And then later, it, it, Justice Valmiki, unfortunately, is not uh, uh, alive now. Uh, he used to open his uh, laptop in his court. And then as he talks now, there is a right direct answer here. Now, what do you say to that? So, so you'll, you'll find that as to how that could object at some point of time to use a laptop in the court, another person was starting to use the same way in, uh, in the court. Uh, just resist the temptation to have only um, courts in physical hearing. Uh, assign some cases for later in the course of the day uh, for virtual hearing. He says, now, sir, I have to go. I have taken an adjournment. I'm going somewhere. Yes, I'll call you in the evening at 6 o'clock. Will you be there available? Ask that question. Let us see how it is. <laughs> Therefore, probably we'll expand ourselves that way. We'll do more work, uh, working from home. Eight percent of all Americans, even before COVID, were working from home. Mm -hmm. and therefore, that was the way. That was the trend. So we all uh, recognize uh, IT people as persons who are truly enabled. Are we not? The same way, probably, uh, truly enabled court will be uh, that court which will open itself to this kind of hearing, and we'll get used to it. The mind will get mapped easily in a short time. Thanks very much, Anand. That's what I think. Justice Anand. Sure. Thank Raja, you. Thank sir, you. Thank uh, you were trying, yeah, sir. You. Yeah. Uh, um, if I may uh, uh, sort of re uh, repeat the question to, for, for purposes of clarity, I think what uh, um, the option the, uh, wants me to address is A, uh, given the state of arbitration in the country, do you think it is going to be a much sought after um, alternate dispute resolution method? And the second question is would not um, a better performing con commercial court? be an answer and an alternate to this alternate remedy. So these, I think, are the two questions. So let me answer the first. Uh, I have a very valid point in saying, given the state of arbitration in our country, um, do you feel that there is any hope for it? We have, we have been saying this from the time we started the uh, manipulative arbitration. Uh, that the way to go is institutional arbitration. Much of the bad name that uh, arbitration, I think, has uh, earned in this country is on account of the fact that it is much of it is still ad hoc. Uh, in an ad hoc, see, one of the greatest advantages of a court system or a justice delivery system, or one of the greatest advantages it should have is certainty. Like right? a litigant going into a court must know what is going to happen to him in terms of procedure. Outcome is, of course, dependent on so many factors, but at least the procedure must be. Um, as we known to him. Now, both our conventional court system and the ad hoc court system suffers from lack of certainty. We have the experience in conventional courts. We argue a matter 80% of the arguments are over, and then suddenly the portfolio changes. It comes up before a different judge who has a completely different set of questions to ask us. So, all this, you know, it is quite a maze and it's very difficult for the litigant to understand. 
uh, he he tells us that the last year English all along get us sir if you were to take us sir all this then we have to mm. do our works and uh, we are duty bound to uh, satisfy these questions which come from court therefore the answer is uh, institutional arbitration so even the institutional arbitration you have certain because the rule say within what time a proceeding could be completed the rule state what procedure will be followed by parties in fact when, uh, uh, i had occasion to appear before the sri krishna commission which was appointed by the central government to look into better uh, functioning of institutional arbitration i told them that one yes. of the greatest problems is ad hoc arbitrators mm -hmm. do not adopt the procedure see we face the reason that under section 34 of the arbitration act one of the grounds on which an award can be set aside is that if a procedure agreed to between the parties is not followed so procedure is a very very valuable tool in making arbitration effective but more ad hoc arbitrations don't adopt a procedure before the arbitration starts so just sri krishna was actually going to frame a draft uh, procedure and it is no part of the schedule to his report is this every arbitrator ad hoc arbitrator must follow this rule even then that is not being done so i would say that unless we shift to ad hoc mm. arbitration future of arbitration in this country yet is going to be bleak of course we don't have figures that's another great problem in the country that you know every sensible developed jurisdiction jurisdiction has access to data right today as they say data is the new oil with data you can do wonders but you don't mm. have the data in fact uh, when mr dariman pali dariman was a member of parliament in 2003 he drafted the uh, statistical official uh, statistics act he drafted it and uh, the the ruling party then uh, said that we will put it to parliament and we will get it passed as law but unfortunately the term ended and nothing happened there after the judicial statistics act has not been followed at all if you have the judicial statistics act you know where the illness is and can direct the remedy towards that you know today that there are some before a district court there are some uh, let us say about uh, 100 specific performance cases make it a specific performance week for the judge and all specific performance suits are posted before him and he is able to complete it because then as he moves he will understand that all these cases fall within certain slots and adjudication becomes so easier for him when justice call was chief justice of the bar as i could i did sir that is all in 2023 please without a legislation you can do this so uh, he said that's a very good idea let's start doing it but a possibility what we will do so today without an act you just need to code all the matters that come into court you need to provide make provisions for the act under which they are filed the provision mm -hmm. under which they are filed and then start clubbing matters and posting it to judges in fact uh, you were part of a judgment which was delivered recently at the judgment where you gave a um, the, you know a supplemental uh, judgment now look at that case that case had to be referred to the uh, division bench because an earlier bench did not A, a binding judgment was not cited for another full page but look at the result matters which have been uh, sent to the uh, district court uh, sessions court will all have to get transferred look at this migration back and forth i mean it's a, a pandemic of cases going from one place to another yes all this would have been avoided if you had statistics if you had data if all this was available then that would be itself becomes a much more easier process and if we had today data of how ad hoc arbitration fares against uh, institutional arbitration i would have been able to establish this argument before you <laughs> but look at our state we don't have the facts how many cases originate how many go into ad hoc how many ad hoc matters are decided in what time how many institutional matters are decided mm. how many are, so we have a severe lack of data and that yes. impacts on the functioning of the judicial system commercial court yes i think it is a good idea but there is a lot of reform that needs to be done there and we have been writing to the uh, judiciary we have been writing to the supreme court primarily under the commercial courts act 
for the first time, the concept that I'm talking about has been given effect to. There is the commercial court statistics data rules. Mm. Mm. Every high court is supposed to print on its website. The I know cases. we are at fault. Pardon? I know we are at fault. Yes. So uh, that has not been uh, uh, published. So with this data, you will be able to chart, plan the path that you will take. But you don't have that data. So uh, therefore, there is really much to be done to the commercial courts. The bar is putting pressure. And we hope something will happen. But yes, the commercial courts work very well. Then possibly they are also ultimately for the litigant, what is important is choice. If course A can give him better results than course B, give him that option. Choice is what consumer rights are about. And therefore, I would say a litigant also being a consumer, he must have the choice of two or three business systems. That is what encourages competition. Competition makes for greater uh, effectiveness. It leads to better efficiency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Raja. Uh, Jawad, yeah. you will take, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the <laughs> question. I think it's a very real problem that uh, which you have pointed out. Sir. Um, what I would say is it is uh, one more tool in the toolkit of lawyers to protract matters. Uh, it is not the only yes. tool. There are many other mm -hmm. tools that lawyers have. Before mediation came mm -hmm. also, we used to protract the proceedings if we uh, either found the you know, judge not in our favor or we found you know, that we need some more time to you know, prolong the matter or we felt it was an advantage for our client. There was a very interesting anecdote I have uh, heard uh, some time back about one of our very famous and very senior lawyers. I don't want to mention the name here. Whenever he wanted an adjournment, he would ask his junior to stack the entire table with books. Yeah, yeah. A large number of books <laughs> will be stacked over there. And, you know, and when the judge would ask, uh, yes, uh, so and so, uh, looks like you're going to take a very long time. Uh, can we have it sometime later? Yes, my lord, just a short Passover until Friday. So that would be a Monday. So, <laughs> so it is just uh, uh, one of the tools, that's all. Now, we, uh, I think the, the courts have taken precautions to ensure that this doesn't happen. Earlier, there was no time limitation for completing a mediation. Uh, today, we have a maximum, uh, we have a limit of 60 days, which can be extended to 90 days. Now, how I see it is, it is a real problem, but uh, in, a, in a tragic, in a, you know, the life cycle of a case, uh, supposing a case is going to be there for 10 years, 90 days, I think, is a time which we can, you know, spare a little to see if there is any possibility of a settlement that can come out of this. Because uh, I think in the hands of a skilled mediator, even uh, uh, clients and lawyers who want to protract the matter, they come for mediation and then they find some merit in uh, you know, exploring the possibility of a settlement, they do so. Because mm -hmm. I, for one, I have, because being a lawyer myself, I have a great uh, amount of faith in my community because I feel as lawyers, not everybody is without integrity, not everybody is uh, without a conscience. We all have a conscience and we all feel that you know, we should do what is good for our clients. And it, it is to that integrity that we need to appeal to. It is to that beauty that we need to appeal to, mm. uh, that we need to do what is best for our client. Uh, apart from that, I can't think of any other way that we can deal with this situation. But like I said, uh, would it be wise to throw the baby with the bathwater? Just because some a few <laughs> oils are using uh, this as a, a tool for protraction. Should we throw out the whole thing and say that, no, we will not refer it to mediation at all? What happens if supposing there's a, uh, there is a scope for uh, settlement between the parties and they can avoid maybe 10 years of protracted litigation and you know the cost, uh, the emotional uh, trauma that it uh, entails? If we can avoid all that, should we not explore it is uh, what I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Incidentally, I just want to highlight uh, a news item I came to see from Hindustan Times today. It speaks of uh, law minister's speech yesterday in Madhav Menon Memorial Lecture. I just read two paragraphs, which will be relevant to the topic of the day. A uh, union law minister so and so on Friday said the world would not be the same post COVID and asked lawyers to adapt to effectively use the digital and physical court process as India's future lies in digital technology. 
the post covid world will be a different world it won't be the same we must begin to prepare ourselves for the digital courts and physical courts must go together with one supplementing the other prasad who also holds a communications department said about future technologies and challenges they could pose for lawyers artificial intelligence will play a crucial role in the coming times you lawyers need to coordinate with new ideas of technology to accelerate the justice delivery system but the human mind will continue to play its role as ai cannot cross examine but only a lawyer can do he cited the example of driverless cars to show how machines cannot take place human consciousness he stressed privacy too and pro- promised a robust data protection law mr prasad praised indigenously developed digital products like the mitron app and expressed confidence that the innate abilities of indians and divine entity of india will help it deliver solution to the covid-19 crisis so what it shows that uh, the judiciary and government should join together so as to keep a platform for uh, develop and uh, um, uh, way forward for this uh, effective adr and odr that's right mr senior saragon when we start when i was pushing you for doing this yes, i sir. had only two things in my mind one yes, was sir. my own selfish motive and the other was to benefit the lawyers the reason yes, is why i was pushing for this webinar and i was virtually troubling you on a daily basis to bring in speakers etc was to get ourselves acquainted with this virtual hearing today uh, the first day when i did it and today when i do it i am very comfortable in doing it i have absolutely no problems in conversing with people so my selfish motive has now been perfectly uh, attended and the second is the number of viewers who have who have listened to this on a daily basis you remember the chaos it used to happen on day 1 yes sir for the first first week today look how peaceful it is happening and they are, they are, they also now have a mindset for for getting information from gaining knowledge through virtual hearing so therefore this was one of the main purposes for which i wanted you to uh, start this and now i i feel that even if 100 people are benefited out of it now they can really manage virtual hearing it's only a matter of time that slowly we can spread it across so yes. as as you rightly said from the news item it is not going to be the post covid is not going to be the same the situation yes. is going to change when it changes it it be, it will become unavoidable to it will, it will become impossible to avoid uh, 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 virtual hearing so therefore somewhere or the other it is going to become part and parcel of the court hearing itself yes. therefore this is a good start which we have made and uh, therefore slowly the brain mapping is now changing is what i think yes, so what as uh, armstrong told the small step now may be a giant leap tomorrow yeah thank you thank you for all the panelists thank you thank, thank you. you thank you thank you so now we have got 5% to ask questions directly i'll move by one by one sir um let me move to mr nazneen malik i'm so firstly um just want to say apologies i just can't get my a screen um the camera to work i've tried but uh, so my apologies for that it's um i'm actually in the uk and it's a great debate and i'm privileged to to have been invited to join into this uh what i wanted to say was really to catch something that jawad said um I, i guess we are a little bit ahead of where india is at this moment in time but one of the the things that you were saying jawad was in all of what you said is absolutely in fact all the speakers have said i concur with sure. but there is one thing that i want to put forward is the benefits to the nation and your society as a whole when you talk about mediation it is not about resolving a dispute at this moment in time but actually developing the individuals that come um to the mediation because they learn how to handle a conflict in a way that actually helps them to open up their mind and something that um you know we deliver here and I deliver it's about how do we change that mindset some people talked about being in the 60s i'm sort of just touching 70 <laughs> and it's important that actually um you know neuroscience has become so progressed so much that 
uh, it is no longer justifiable to say we can't change. It's about explaining to people how we can change our mindset, no matter what the age, and we can take things forward. And that is one of the, I feel like, the spin-offs, the benefits to the individuals who come to mediation. Uh, but then if you multiply that, the benefits to society of how they handle conflict, it is no longer about taking out guns, taking out <laughs> batons, and you know, getting rid of people. Um, you know, in some of our societies, this is what happens. But how we develop that society is to actually say there's another way of actually handling disputes, apart from the court size, but also about how we manage our civil society. So the great benefits of actually, you know, mediations. Um, it, that that side um, has to come into play as well when we think about while we're offering mediations. And yes, there will always be cases that are not mediatable that have to go to the courts. And I heard somebody say there are hybrid things about mm -hmm. med are med, and so you know those need to be looked at as well. So. Um, that was really it. I think the soft skills need to be developed is I guess what I'm saying and how important they are. We are just picking those up is when we do mediation is that we actually, the important being is not to understand the framework, but actually understand the soft skills required for a mediator to be able to actually achieve success and settlement quite rapidly if you have those developed. So there's things like, you know, how the brain works, the neuroscience of it, it's also about, um, you know, other softer skills, sorry, that come into play. And it's when we do mediation training, those um, emphasis needs to be placed on that side as well. Um, that's all I wanted to say at this moment in time. But Thank you very much, ma'am, for your insightful uh, response. Mr. Abhishek. Good afternoon, sir. And thank you for a very erudite lecture by Justice Kanan, Mr. Raja and Javaji. And I completely agree with the points that you have raised. I had just one query, rather a suggestion, and you can dwell upon it. It is in respect of the cost. Commercial Court Act came with an amendment. The amendment postulates that mediation is a prerequisite for the purpose of filing the suit. If you have to file a suit, you must first resort to mediation and only when the mediation fails, you can go to court. But it is not backed up by a penalty clause. Now, if we were to, in practice, even in cases of institutional arbitrations, as Raja sir is also part of the, uh, the arbitration institutions, if we were to award cost to against those parties who don't resort to mediation before resorting to actual approaching the court or going for arbitration, dispute mm -hmm. resolution, without resorting to mediation and cost can be modulated in that sense. And it can be, even if a party is successful and he has chosen not to resort to mediation, cost can be modulated to that effect. This is my view and I will leave it to the panel to have a discussion on this aspect because it will require a transition from the way we practice today to a future practice because when costs are awarded based on actions of the lawyers by choosing not to resort to mediation or to just go to court of law and get their dispute, seeking to get their dispute resolved. What is your opinion on that? Thank you, sir. Oh, I would say that uh, yes, the Commercial Courts Act does say that you have to, but there is a loophole there. And you, you know, advocates are very famous, they like these loopholes. It says that uh, <laughs> you have to do that only if there is no interim order. Uh, only when there is no application for interim orders, it goes into mediation. So every advocate will immediately find some application for some interim order, some appointment of a commissioner, or, you know, some uh, injection or uh, some such thing. So that is the first uh, problem. The second problem is, I agree with you that there must be a system which we put in place which says that uh, you must uh, uh, go for mediation before you go for either uh, arbitration. That that is where things like medar clause comes, in, where even in an arbitration after arbitration has started, it may make good sense. I know a lot of infection. This is uh, Ibrahim Kalifula, for example. 
he settles more matters than he passes over so uh, which means in his own way he is trying to mediate and try settlement between parties um, but there is also this bit about the mediator himself not being an arbitrator so possibly you have a better system that the arbitrator you first convince the parties that before the arbitration starts that why don't you take take a chance at uh, mediation and then sends it to a different uh, mediator who will try and uh, ensure that this is all done but in all this what just is uh, anand vikrish uh, pointed out is a very very important fact you must not use all these tools to delay delay the proceedings because for one party uh, every day's delay is causing him some detriment and therefore you must be very sure um, that if that party suffers a detriment then he should be compensated by cost that is why the 2015 amendments we spent a lot of time in deliberations and we introduced provisions for uh, cost uh, to form as being very very um, uh, rigidly implemented i don't know how many arbitrators do that but if you do that there is hope that the system itself will move to a more refined cost aspect is something which is very serious in many jurisdictions um, in uh, in canada in uk and in, uh, in nearer home singapore uh, after a case is concluded there's the same way as uh, in the criminal jurisprudence we are used to hearing posting it to another date for sentencing after delivering a judgment after delivery of judgment on cost uh, there will be arguments required to make and there it be uh, asked whether there were any efforts done previously to settle what was the amount where did it come to all these are done actively in canada so therefore it is perfectly legitimate after all the cpc does not say it shouldn't be done it should not be adopted that way so therefore uh, that there had been an attempt made is always important except justice sb sinha in supreme court you will find in many cases judges saying uh, in the result parties to bear their own costs they never thought cost was an important element to be added to punish a person who is needlessly contesting or uh, rewarding a person who has a lawful uh, thing there was really nothing for the other side to contest but they still doing it so therefore these are important things this time i have known in one judgment in 1 uh, crore 37 lakhs was what was awarded by the delhi high court it was modified by the uh, supreme court later by justice ravindran said no this is all not possible the cost cannot be the way a person has actually undergone cost but in all cases where courts now uh, must realize that if we want to stop all vexatious litigation cost is a very important thing but in our understanding our access to justice many people who are poor are coming to court therefore no cost they would have become poor by litigation that's what could have happened so therefore uh, it's for every judge to think of cost as a relevant thing to be added at the time when he disposes of the case and to ask at least when he's delivered a judgment or just before it or a call or post judgment to say you know what happened really all that is fine it should be done i would uh, therefore i uh, think uh, there was a good point made by abhishek thanks abhishek i'm sure you have a judge already listening to you and i'm sure there will be other persons as well who think it's relevant uh, can i just uh, srinivas ragan if time permits can i just say something on what uh, yes, yes. yeah 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 time is not the concern jawad sir okay no uh, nasreen was talking about you know soft skills development of soft skills in media yes? now here i would just like to point out uh, something which has been of uh, very deep concern to many of uh, our media from the media the community uh, for example if you take uh, you know companies uh, the companies act section 442 uh, says that you know mediation should be resorted to now if you see the rules rule 4 if i remember correctly uh, describes the qualifications for the mediator now the qualifications if you see first it talks about uh retired high court judges supreme court judges then it talks about senior advocates then it talks about chartered accountants then it talks about company secretaries and last it talks about trained mediators now this is something which i really cannot understand for the simple reason that 
the the whole you know what what this shows is that the presumption is that mediation is just an ad hoc process where you just make two parties sit yes baba what's your problem what's your problem okay why don't you resolve it why don't you try this why don't you no it doesn't it is not that simple mediation is a very nuanced process a lot of soft mediators are trained in a lot of soft skills like communication skills listening skills how you listen to parties how you understand their emotions how you deal with their emotions you know how you uh, help them to vent out their emotions how do you create a safe environment for them to you know vent those emotions and then go forward move forward from that stage so giving the least priority to training is something totally incomprehensible to me and i think that is one of the biggest disservices that we are doing to mediation and my request since just anand venkatesh is there i would request uh, him to take up this issue even with our committee because even our tamil nadu mediation rules uh, mediation center rules uh, they they are almost you know similar to rule 4 of the company act where the least importance is given to training of mediator as a matter of fact i would further say that you know this 40 hour basic training itself is insufficient because that is why we you know we find that uh, the quality of mediation suffers a lot here mm. uh, apart from the fact that you know the, the it can be used for protracting the matters many matters don't succeed only because the mediators are not trained enough they don't understand these fine nuances they just have this 40 hour training and then they jump into mediation there is no assessment done there is no evaluation done and uh, there is no mentoring done of the mediators there are no refresher courses that are frequently held as is required refresher courses are held but not uh, with the same kind of frequency that is required there so these are all you know changes that we need to bring if you really we really want the system to work efficiently and effectively so unless we give importance to the training part of it and stop treating mediation as a poor cousin of arbitration or litigation mm. <laughs> as nothing but just a glorified kangaroo court with only the stamp of legitimacy because it is being uh, uh, referred by the court unless we change this attitude and take a positive approach to it and understand how nuanced the process is because a lot of neuroscience is involved in that in our training we talk about you know uh, a lot of neuroscientific aspects of you know how people react to conflict how they respond to conflict so i am very <coughs> grateful to nazreen for bringing out this aspect because that gave me an opportunity to speak on this which actually i wanted to speak but i thought i was taking up too much time so mm. i i had to stop somewhere so this is something which i would request our judiciary to keep in mind and uh, you know many times we come across matters just being referred to uh, senior advocates or to judges for mediation who have not undergone the training mm. so it is not uh, mm. uh, it is not just a process where you can uh, use your skills as a judge to resolve a matter it, it is much more nuanced than that so understand judges would need the training to do mediation in fact just as sanjay kishan call used to emphasize on more on that and he always every time he spoke about mediation he would say that he has undergone mediation training twice and that has helped him to become a better judge so those are his words so that's all i want thank you mr anand the government were proposing to set up conciliation courts across india you mean conciliation centers within the courts conciliation yes sir conciliation courts as such i think that that is a sort of a what can we call it it's a paradox to say that you know court and conciliation that's so, what they are uh, i think rather oxymorons <laughs> yeah, it is an oxymoron i'm sorry i was searching for that word oxymoron it didn't strike me really so as it is a happily married it's an oxymoron <laughs> <laughs> no sometimes happily married can be a reality <laughs> all these conciliatory courts my 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 wife is sitting in the room so i'm happy uh, i'm i'm safe here <laughs> it's locked inside <laughs> this so, for fun self <laughs> no but but i, I don't uh, i mean i am not aware just it's anand venkatesh can enlighten us on that if he's aware of it but conciliation court somehow is uh, you know it's an oxymoron yes, sir there are there are proposals i think and uh, it is being implemented everywhere we have our own adr center in our uh, high court so i think we need to focus on the infrastructure also if we are going to make uh, court, uh, uh, an ex mediation successful uh, of course uh, the autonomy part of it as raja said there is some certain level of autonomy that is required uh, that's a different matter but uh, as far as the infrastructure is concerned we need to have that infrastructure to really make them effective 
uh, I had proposed that you know we should actually move the mediation centers a little away from the courts, mm-hmm. near the court but not in the court campus, so that you know when parties enter, the litigants enter the building, it should be a totally different uh, you know atmosphere there. The the whole thing should be a completely different experience for them, and help them to relax and uh, you know uh, uh, think of no, uh, not think of it as just an extension of the court, but something which is a completely different thing altogether. So because the whole idea is only to make them to you know relax, collaborate with each other, understand each other, that can't be done in a very crowded and uh, you know in a very uh, uh, in an environment where they are not really comfortable. Actually, I think one other uh, um, improvement has to be somehow brought in, which is considering the fact that the government is the largest litigator before court. Yes. You know that um, in the usual course, there is nobody in the government department who will be interested with the authority to settle the matter. Yes. Because if he settles the matter, his neighbor will immediately send out an anonymous letter and <laughs> say that he took money and settled the matter. So nobody wants to put his uh, head on the block. and actually take a decision may so many cases uh, the judges would have seen in the disposal i mean yes. why can't the government just settle the matter it is a settled position in law and uh, they know this is how it has to happen but nobody wants to take a decision uh, therefore how do we get around this problem this again a great problem in mediation how do we get officers who who can be authorized uh, and who can be uh, empowered to take a decision and to settle a matter that is going to be the greatest challenge considering the fact that the government is the largest litigator in court both just take land acquisition matters it is all a formula and uh, uh, or macd op cases why can't these officers just settle the matter uh, but the problem again is the roadblock to that is uh, empowerment and uh, somebody being the authority given the authority that is that is something which the system has to address effectively yeah, mr raja i want to interject here like how you yeah. have pecuniary jurisdiction in courts there are pecuniary jurisdictions that are given to these officers also every officer at a particular level can settle only up to a particular amount am i right yes sir before beyond that they want to go to the regional office or head office for that's right that's right police department is the highest litigator the second one was uh, education in both these departments for various levels of litigation committees had been set up in the court calling the chief secretary the uh, the home secretary and the the police uh, for home secretary for police uh, education secretary these people were there uh, committees were set up for uh, uh, handling litigation so that okay. the litigated courts that there is a responsible replies and responses to persons who have grievances and okay. if uh, that is not done then it can be in court so it was some kind of a, a mechanism with uh, justice surikant that played and we had tried it with some amount some measure of success i can't say suddenly the litigation drop was felt or appreciated but it could be surely tried in various places you can identify from your board uh, just as anand is there you can probably find out which department in the uh, red jurisdiction uh, engages in the largest uh, uh, litigation and look mm. department and then try and see whether you can call the department heads and find out what they can do uh, yes. this representation for instance what keep on happening because they don't respond at all it shouldn't happen at all we should ensure that there is someone who is responsible and we'll hold him responsible why is it come to us in a situation where there had been a, a notice given you have not responded they are there before us in a litigation this is not the kind of a litigation policy you must have, be able to evolve in our own court and make it work Okay. Uh, if I can just add to what Justice Kannan said, uh, in the U.S. there are uh, several federal statutes that mandate mediation. So the the uh, the uh, federal government officials are mandated to use mediation in resolving many of the disputes that come up under those statutes. Now we still have a long way to go there, and knowing the way our executive drags its legs in doing this, uh, it's going to take quite a long time. but one proactive step that uh, i feel that the judiciary can take is when you refer matters to mediation where you feel that you know a, a dispute with the government can be resolved through mediation i think some element of protection can be given to the officer who takes part in the mediation uh, so that later on he is not put into question as to why he took such a decision 
uh, because we face this problem. In fact, I was uh, some time back I was mediating a matter uh, where the government official came and told us that the other side has a genuine claim. He, he asked for a private session. Uh, he was the commissioner of sugars. He asked mm. for a private session, and he said the the claim of the, uh, the union is legitimate. Uh, we have to concede that. But the only problem is we can't do it in mediation. We would appreciate it if it's a court order. Because tomorrow I will be called to account as to True. why I have to so make it an order of court. Yes. So mm -hmm. the judiciary can be a little more proactive in that. I'm sure that you know many of these uh, the officials. I think a certain amount of people, <coughs> uh, judges can call the officials and you know explain to them the benefits of it, and also tell them that uh, there will be they will be given suitable protection if they uh, uh, okay. reach a, a genuine resolution. Okay, point taken. Yeah. Yeah. So I have one uh, incident which can be taken note by Justice Kannan, and uh, if it is answered, any VJ can pass an order in the court. I have come across incidents where insurance company officials, bank officials, and government departments they are unwilling to come to mediation center on the footing that they are incompetent or not authorized to sign any agreement on behalf of the department. So in the absence of any authority or written instruction to sign a mediation agreement, they prefer local dollars and not mediation center. True. How to resolve, answer the, or quell the doubts of the officers who represent the government departments? Uh, it is uh, possible, surely, uh, with uh, Sanjay Kishan there, sit, seated by my side, uh, there was um, an sent to all managers uh, at various levels of the insurance company, from uh, the regional managers uh, and then the divisional managers, and then you had uh, the other persons. All of them were called to the court. Uh, it was uh, held in the large hall. And then uh, I was telling them about uh, how various types of cases will be decided. I had circulated all the judgments and uh, had also a template made about the various heads of claim uh, which will be answered to which to what amounts yes. so therefore this uh, template was supposed to be also filled in and then handed over in the council will you believe me we used to be doing somewhere close to about uh, 2500 to 3000 cases a month uh, so uh, the number would seem unreal but it is uh, true it was possible to engage in conversations previously commit them in the presence of the chief justice and then he will say that it should go in this fashion only. So I'm sure it is possible to involve uh, top level officers to call them over. And uh, if the Chief Justice makes a judicious intervention in these matters, it is possible to strategize and ensure that it is done. They will always come to, uh, for mediation, they will always say that I can't do it at this level. Even at mm -hmm. local dialects, you would have it would have been encountered by some of our judges who would have seen that uh, sir, this is above our level, I'll have to take concurrence. That is done even in local dollars. So, so uh, it is something, a previous arrangement which we must make. If they are yes, at all times fending off any attempts to settle or bringing them to a mediation table itself gets to be difficult. We'll have to engage in some prior conversations. Now, not any longer possible after Krishnamurti jurisprudence. We are not putting it to place. There is it is essential in every case that a case is taken up by the mediation cell before it goes to a course. But then we, every day, now I, I was looking at the statistics today that uh, you have in so many courts. I was there in Tirunamalai. I was speaking to the you know, district judge there. And the other persons are there. Probably they will also know. They were saying that all cases are not there before mediation cell. We do somewhere close to about some. 40, 60 cases I decide every day. I was, saying, I was asking out of 60, how many cases are cases relating to death? Uh, you will say probably about 50-60%. Cases relating to death where the involvement of the vehicle is involved to still go through a litigative process is just unfair. Every, every item of uh, amount that can be given as compensation is uh, handled by Pranayasethi. So therefore, we will not reward any person who undertakes all these trials and then disposes of cases and earns three units or whatever way we call it. We will ensure why have, why have these matters not got disposed of in local dollar? Why have we not settled? If there is an insurance company, call the insurance company and get to do. Administrative judges of the respective districts will be able to see that and monitor to ensure that certain types of litigation just can't 
be taken now a lot of persons are left we are two and a half hours behind i'll just tell you this it is going to soon come because i didn't take up artificial intelligence though i am a part of the supreme court appointment committee i know what's happening there and because of covid meetings could not take place module is near ready for motor accident claims compensation it's going to be possible for you to apply artificial intelligence and then bring down a drop down menu of these right. facts, these uh, laws uh, uh, apply this could be the compensation the judge will see whether the proper compensation has been arrived at because it can always tweak Uh, a, a judge can modify that artificial intelligence cannot supplant uh, human intelligence but it's possible for you to bring out reasonably predictable outcomes by the application of artificial intelligence true and acquisition compositions and things will not be will not go through trial any longer if only uh, of what ai recommendation committee recommendations will be accepted Uh, at some point of time it can work in a big way the other areas as well i don't want to talk about it now at some other time but surely there is a scope for immediate settlement even in matters where the insurance company says that they won't settle because they don't have a doubt sri nivesh sir i may request uh, your lordship's indulgence in saying that when an insurance company officer or a bank officer or a government official can sign a memorandum before the lok adalat memo of compromise why not they sign an agreement before the mediation sir there is no difference as, as it is everybody perceive me to be too proactive i'll take this also into consideration <laughs> so this is quite possible as a judicial intervention sir <laughs> <laughs> do not as a pill <laughs> so that's what that's the purpose of uh, no no that's that's the that's the very reason that i am sitting through the whole thing just to exactly. understand exactly. what comes out of it exactly I, there are lots exactly. of takeaways for me Thank which you, I will have to reflect by way of court orders. Only. We hope so. Yes, yes, hope, yes. hope there will be a band of us. Thanks a lot to all the three panelists for the spending their valuable time and uh, patiently attending the program. Thanks, sir. Thanks a lot.